Good evening and welcome to Chicago tonight on this Wednesday, April 17th. This would appear to be something where might have been someone who's not experienced doing the bookkeeping for a committee. A Chicago Tonight exclusive. Former mayoral candidate Amara Enya faces new questions about her, how her campaign spent its money. And so I think for many people it caught them by surprise given uh, the notoriety of the case. The Cook County State's Attorney's Office releases thousands of internal documents relating to the Jesse Smollett case. What do they tell us? Uh, you're almost out the door, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I'm not pushing you out the door, I'm just saying that... Change is coming to Chicago City Hall. The rundown with Chicago Tonight's political team in this week's Spotlight Politics. Hear from the author of a new book about black women dating outside their own race and why she believes more women should consider doing it. Some of the songs go way back, <laughs> and but I so do I. She was a working pianist in Chicago for 78 years. Now at 102, she still got it. Jeffrey Bear floats some theories about one of Chicago's most enduring mysteries. And Chicago artists who use creativity to battle destructive impulses, plus an artist who hasn't spoken in nearly 60 years. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brandis Friedman. New property assessments are coming. Amanda Venicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Cook County will use a new formula to assess how much your property is worth. Assessor Fritz Kage has publicly unveiled the model he'll use to determine residential property values. Frustration with Cook County's property tax assessment system and accusations it was skewed to favor more expensive homes helped unseat, it helped, that is, Kage unseat the previous assessor, Joe Berrios, in last year's election. The new modeling code and associated data can be found online. Residential properties in Cook County are reassessed every three years. Chicago homes are up in 2021. A week after Chicago's City Council approved a billion dollar tax subsidy for the Lincoln Yards development, community groups are suing to stop it. They say by law, tax increment financing or TIF money is supposed to help develop blighted areas. They say the area between Lincoln Park and Bucktown doesn't meet that definition. The strategy of the city of Chicago to prioritize our public dollars and to give them to the wealthy developers to to make sure that they move to wealthy neighborhoods is the complete misuse of the program and is why today Grassroots Collaborative, along with Raise Your Hand for Illinois Public Education, are filing a lawsuit to stop this TIF from moving forward. The lawsuit also alleges the city is violating the state civil rights act because TIFs are benefiting white wealthy areas, not low income and minority neighborhoods. Neither Sterling Bay nor the mayor's office had any comment. The prospect of legalizing cannabis has activists in the African-American community split. The state NAACP has come out against it, saying black communities need jobs and a focus on social justice, not drugstores. What we don't need is another way to, to intoxicate and to, to, to keep our, our communities um, drugged up, high. Uh, it's, it's no, no different than saying we need more liquor stores in our communities. But others see it as an opportunity for minority entrepreneurs. Governor J.B. Pritzker has said a top priority is making sure any proposal ensures business opportunities go to communities of color most affected by the war on drugs. Lawmakers are also considering expunging criminal pot records. Legislation is expected to be introduced this month. As for the weather, tonight a 50% chance of thunderstorms, otherwise cloudy with a low of 52. Tomorrow, rain and storms are again possible, and it'll be cloudy with a high temp of 54 degrees. Now, Brandis, back to you. Amanda, thank you. It's been more than three weeks since the Cook County State's Attorney's Office dropped all 16 felony charges against Empire actor Jussie Smollett for allegedly filing a false police report. Last night, that office released 
thousands of pages of documents related to Smollett's case. And here to help us make sense of these records is WTTW News reporter Matt Masterson. Matt, what are these documents and how were they obtained? So what was released last night, it was more than 150 pages of text conversations and more than 3,600 pages of emails related to the prosecution of Jesse Smollett that were coming from Kim Fox's office. Um, these came in response to a Freedom of Information request. And a lot of it has to deal with various media requests and media inquiries into this obviously high profile case, but the documents do shed some light on what was going on inside the state's attorney's office during this prosecution. So what were some of the interesting findings? Uh, the biggest thing here is that Kim Fox was still tracking and discussing the Smollett case with her staff even after she said that she had recused herself. Um, she had repeated on numerous occasions that she recused herself from this case in February, that she handed it over to her top assistant, Joe McGatz, and that she had nothing to do it with it from that point. On. But in the text, it shows a bit of a different story. It shows that Fox communicated with McGatz weeks after that recusal, specifically discussing the possibility that they had overcharged Smollett. Uh, in one text, Fox refers to Smollett as a washed up celeb and compared the number of charges in his case to that of R. Kelly, the R&B singer who faces fewer counts in his aggravated sexual assault, assault case. Uh, even though there's four alleged victims in that one. Um, so Fox issued a statement Wednesday after these came out saying that she only reached out to McGatz after her recusal to discuss their use of appropriate charging authority. So do any of these documents conflict with what Fox and her office have told the press? Uh, it appears that way at least a little bit. Um, again, Fox has continued saying that she had fully recused herself from this case back in February, including in an interview that she did with us the day after charges were dropped. Just to be clear, did you sign off on the resolution of this case at all? Or you were no. completely uh, recused from every every aspect of it? Correct. I was completely recused. And who was it that uh, that did do the... Uh, um, the First assistant, Joe McGatz. And Joe McGatz told me something similar when I asked him the same question just one day earlier. Were you involved with this case from the time it was charged? I know uh, Kim Fox obviously recused herself at some point, but were you involved before then throughout? Yes, or? yes throughout. Did, she, did you have any conversations with her after she recused herself about this case or about your decision no. uh, to wrap this case up? Now, Matt, does anything else stand out here? Um, so in these texts and emails, uh, there's a lot of other things in there, obviously. Uh, the same day that charges against Millette were dropped, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson appeared at a press conference where he, he appeared irritated and said that the decision to drop these charges didn't reflect uh, justice being served. Um, but in the text, Fox says that she informed Johnson of what was going on that day and why. And she said in one specific text that Johnson seemed satisfied with her explanations. Um, and the state's attorney's office also seemed to be caught off guard with just the big public backlash to their decision to drop these charges. Um, one, in another text, an assistant state's attorney said that she wished she could have better anticipated the magnitude of this case and planned a bit better. So what's been left out or redacted and why? So on top of all these emails and texts, uh, Fox's office included a 36-page list of emails and uh, texts that had been redacted or removed from this FOIA request. Uh, in there, again, it was a lot of conversations between media, media requests, things like that, but they also included texts between Fox and McGatz. They also included texts between McGatz and other state's attorneys within their office discussing this case, and for various reasons, either due to private information included in there or case details discussed between them, these were removed from uh, the FOIA response. And what's the latest on the city's lawsuit against Smollett? Like, is is there a chance that we'll see the court records unsealed? So the city just filed a civil suit last week in which it is demanding Smollett pay back the, the overtime charges for the police department that they spent investigating his claims. Um, there's been no progress on that since it was filed. It was just filed last week, so there's been no movement on that. Um, as for the court records, um, various media outlets have filed a motion demanding that those do be uh, unsealed, um, and a judge is expected to rule on that sometime next month. Okay, Matt Masterson, thank you. And up next, our Spotlight Politics team digests the top political stories of the week. We just heard about the latest troubles plaguing Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox. What might that
that mean for her political future? And we finally have results from the April 2nd election, results that mean more change at City Hall. Chicago Tonight's Spotlight Politics team is here to cover that and more. So welcome back, Amanda Vinicky, Paris Schutz, and Carol Marine. Good to be here. So we just, <laughs> good to be here as usual. Well, we're paid to we be have here. No yeah. <laughs> they make us do this, it's our job. So we just heard from Matt Masterson about Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox. You know, she's been in the spotlight since those charges were dropped. Um, will the release of these texts damage her politically? Not, it, it, if you already hate Kim Fox, the texts just make you hate her more. If you like Kim Fox and you're okay with her, the texts won't change that. I think this is really polarized. Um, Kim Fox is still popular, I think, among progressives in minority communities, because as she's saying in that text, you know, we, we, we want to have a different approach to the state's attorney's office. We don't want to just lock everybody up. We don't want to waste our resources on overcharging people. Um, but if you're more a law and order type, then you think those texts are damning. So I, I think nothing really changes um, as a result of that release. Unless you're somewhere in the middle. I mean, probably the worst mistake she made was the first mistake, which was taking Tina Chen's call. The minute somebody says, Jussie Smollett, you say, I'm hanging up the phone. This is not something I can discuss. That's what an experienced prosecutor must do. And so <clears throat> that was sort of the first domino to fall. And then after that, subsequent to that, is the sort of shifting landscape of what does recuse mean? And what does it not mean? And obviously that definition just didn't get worked out clearly in that office. I think to satisfy people who may not be on the left or the right, but somewhere down the middle that are going to consider other candidates. She may still win. I'm not saying she wouldn't, but, uh, but I think she has hurt herself. I think it also just damages the credibility of the office in itself because you want to take particularly an attorney in the state's attorney at that at her word and to say I have recused myself from this case but then to intervene interfere with it really is what that text shows it's minor people may her protectors certainly may believe that it is for just cause but nonetheless it certainly is getting involved in a case that she had publicly distance herself from. So that I think certainly does damage, again, perhaps not politically, because we don't know yet who's running against her, if anybody, it's too far out. But certainly that text, yeah, there, there's plenty let, that you can put in a commercial. Let's remind that. everybody that politically, she's very close with Tony Preckwinkle, Cook County Board President, who publicly today was supporting her again. I've heard rumors that perhaps Tony Preckwinkle, who wants to have an influence on this office, might be looking for someone else to run for that office, or perhaps Kim Fox is isn't going to run again. Fran Spielman of the Sun-Times asked Joe Ferguson, the IG, whether he would run for state's attorney. He didn't answer that question. Uh, so kind of left it open. And then there's also been rumors of Jerry Joyce, the guy that ran for mayor. There might will be, be people running. I mean, let's look at past state's attorney's races. They have been filled with available candidates. So, so <clears throat> assume uh, for, for on the basis of history that there will be plenty of people who are going to oppose Kim Fox. What about with the Chicago Police Department? Has this further damaged her credibility? She's taken a lot of heat from them about her handling of this so far. Yes. I mean, and that was already a fraught relationship because whenever you argue as a progressive that we're putting too many people in jail, too many poor people for too long when they can't make bail and get out, and some of these crimes are, are much smaller rather than larger, yes, then the police and the state's attorney are going to be at odds. This has exacerbated whatever wounds previously existed. Her office was also, uh, we just heard Matt say, they were evidently surprised by the magnitude of the media reaction. What did they expect? Brandis, I have to say, that was befuddling to me. I mean, I don't watch Empire, I have to admit. Still haven't, <laughs> um, <laughs> even after all of this. But clearly people do, and you. this was evidenced by not just the Chicago media, but I mean, there was worldwide attention on this case. You could see it. You had a hard time getting into the Leighton Criminal Court building. You, I mean, walking out, you saw this horde of journalists and photographers going after Jesse Smollett. He's known worldwide now. So why there wouldn't be a fierce media reaction and a lot of tension on this case, 
I mean, duh. It's mystifying. That to me That's is mystifying. It, well, and they're fielding <laughs> calls from CNN and TMZ. I mean, their communications people are taking all these calls every day, so they know what's happening. That that doesn't make any it, sense. It just doesn't. Do they think we'd all just go away? Yeah, I well, am. And that's that. That is what, there. <laughs> that, that is what crossed her mind as well. Like this, this is what you're concerned about is just the the magnitude of the media reaction well, versus I, what it is you're managing. Here's the thing: we still don't have answered is why didn't Smollett at least have to admit some kind of culpability? Why was he able to go out and say? Uh, what he said and said I was innocent and I wouldn't be my mother's son if I had done any of these things and did the case fall apart did something happen with the yeah, twins that right. were the key witnesses where maybe the Smollett camp had gotten to them somehow you don't know that and, and we might learn this in the next couple of weeks that something had fallen apart with the case yeah let's be clear on what all of these records do and don't show and it they don't show exactly what Paris said I think, they in a sense, forget. people right. just are interested. Sure, if you you know lose your phone and people were able to look through all the text somebody sent, it, it's like the inner workings of an office of a prominent person. And clearly, you could see in some of those texts. I mean, so with you know five or six O's on the end, it, it's kind of an indicator of how somebody acts when they're not just in front of the cameras and a microphone. Patrick Blanchard's report, the IG, the county IG that she has now invited to come in and take a look at this. It may not be the Mueller report at the end of the summer <laughs> but but there will be a huge amount of attention on, on that report. Hopefully not redacted. Yes. That report. <laughs> like the Mueller report yeah. is likely Just a to summary. be. <laughs> um, let's move on to pensions. Governor J.B. Pritzker he's promised a ba balanced budget but his plan re relies on some controversial changes to how much money the state puts into its underfunded pension systems. It sounds a little familiar. Why hasn't this gotten more attention, Amanda? You know, that is something that considering, sure, pensions might make everybody's eyes glaze over a little bit, and yet, clearly, in recent years, it has become very well known that this is a huge problem for the state of Illinois. And therefore, I, I don't know, this is again one where I guess I'm a little surprised that it hasn't gotten more attention, because previous governors, when they have tried this, have been, I mean, persecuted over it. And the fact that Pritzker would now introduce this, people are tying it to, you know, what Jim Edgar did, what Rod Blagojevich did. Um, Edgar still a fairly popular name, but not in that, in that regard. And so I, I think it is striking, and it's something that certainly will have long-lasting consequences for the state. Uh, Pritzker defends it, but certainly the critics have a point. It may just be that I, I think really a lot of it is that He's a Democrat, he's still in this honeymoon period, and Democrats are generally sticking by him, at least publicly. But I think also the flashiest thing that he's proposing and the most controversial is the progressive income tax. So people are looking over there, and then in they're looking- of course. And they're looking, looking at, at this shi looking at shiny pot. object of marijuana. So it's like, look over here, look over there, and it, down the middle is this business of changing the pension ramp or delaying the payment. Pay no attention and, to the pensions over here. And there, and there is an element, but if, if you're looking at marijuana, gotta counsel you that that is spitting in the ocean in terms of the money it will produce compared to what delaying pensions means in a, in a fiscal sense or what the progressive income can, can I add means. in uh, Chicago and other municipalities have horrible pension problems too and they want including Rahm Emanuel they want the state to take over those pension funds in addition to the pension problems that the state faces so and and there's a task force looking at actually doing that like consolidating consolidating the pay, but but where I I think Rahm Emanuel actually wants the the state to actually have a police and fire pension fund and not have the city pay into those funds like That's it does now it, yeah. so <laughs> so there's a heavy lift here yeah heavy lift everyone sure. has to dream yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've all got our dreams dream, dream, are, dream. are legislators going to go along with him on this Amanda I don't know. Uh, it certainly seems as when you talk to people, in fact, you know, Carol interviewed a couple of lawmakers on the show the other day who expressed some reticence, but they didn't flat out say no. Yeah. I've spoken with several who say that they are very squeamish about going along with this plan, but they aren't willing to say that really on the record just yet. And it gets back to what I had talked about and that uh, Democrats are really excited to have a Democrat in office, let alone J.B. Pritzker, who of course has a ton of independent money that could be used in future campaigns. They want to present a united front. So I, I, I don't know if this is going to happen, but it is certainly something that they are very weary about and therefore when people thought that it would just be a done deal, not so much. Supermajority, supermajority. That 
ultimately may decide it. Let's go to City Council very quickly. We have results from City Council races that until now had been too close to call. Who are the winners and what does this say uh, that these races were so close all this time? Well, that your vote counts. And, and when you say my vote doesn't matter because right? it came down to 12 or 13 votes in the 33rd Ward that the, the winners here, well, Rosana Rodriguez Sanchez, uh, the Democratic Socialists of America, there's six of them now, I believe, on City Council. She beat Deb Mel. Uh, by just a few points, Deb Mel, obviously the, the daughter of former Alderman Dick Mel. And then Jim Kappelman is the incumbent. He barely held on to his seat against an upstart, Marianne Lalonde. This is going to be very interesting for Lori Lightfoot because her coalition here is a completely disconnected group that includes Ty Fainer, who is a conservative uh, um, legal guy from Mayor Brown, and and Democratic Socialists. How are you going to please all of those people? How are you going to please the six Democratic Socialists on City Council, the 25 or so people that kind of went along with Rahm Emanuel and Rich Daly and everyone else? Not kind of. <clears throat> they did. Went, they, they did go along with, but so it is a loose and and really unknown kind of body that is the city council. Ty Fainer, by the way, isn't on city council. We should emphasize. Not on city council, but a supporter of Lightfoot. But, but truly. But, so she's got she's got to cobble together a, a series of relationships, many of which she's never really entered into before. She's got to assemble a cabinet. She has to figure out who's going to run her law department. There's a lot for her to do in such a short period of time. And quickly before we go, is City Council going to be dramatically different from what we're used to seeing? Yes, uh, unless Lori Lightfoot does what her predecessors did and meet with every alderman and say, what do you want in your ward? And if I give you that, will you get on a very what difficult vote <laughs> on budget and taxes? If she doesn't do that, we're going to see a very active City Council and votes that may not pass. And Amanda, the deadline to file and pay taxes this past week, uh, this week, excuse me, Governor Pritzker didn't make the deadline. He didn't make the deadline, but he says this is no big deal. We all know he is one of Illinois, in fact, one of the world's wealthiest men, and so he's got complicated taxes. He, you know, took that extension and will be going there, but used the question as an opportunity to once again sell that graduated income tax, or as he terms it, the fair tax. Amanda Vinicky, Paris Schutz, and Carol Marine, thanks as always, guys. And there is more Chicago tonight ahead, so please stay with us. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, why one local sociologist believes more black women should consider dating outside their own race. She came to Chicago at 17 and played piano professionally for nearly eight decades. At 102, she's still got it. It's no yoke, the story of a prairie district mansion turned egg warehouse in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. And two local artists, as well as one from New Zealand, stretch the definition of outsider art. But first, the campaign for mayor is over, but one of the candidates is facing new questions surrounding her campaign expenditures. Paris Schutz is here with exclusive details. Paris. Brandis, Amara Anya finished six out of the 14 candidates in the February uh, election for mayor. Famously, she received big donations from superstars like Kanye West and Chance the Rapper. But new information she recently filed with the state's Board of Elections has that board looking for answers as to exactly how that money has been accounted for. Rap superstar Kanye West came to the rescue when Enya's campaign stumbled out of the gate. He paid off $73,000 in fines that Enya racked up in her 2015 bid for mayor. Throughout this campaign, Enya billed herself as a young, progressive break from the status quo, someone who was from the West Side and would focus on neighborhood development. But stories of workplace and financial problems and failure to pay taxes dogged her campaign. Still, she attracted the attention and money of West and fellow superstar Chance the Rapper. The two collectively put in $600,000 for her run. But campaign statements filed this week raised new questions about how that money was recorded. 
According to the Elections Board, roughly 70 payments to different campaign workers were listed as being sent to this one address near Little Italy. It's an apartment Enya lived in until at least 2014 and is currently the home of her sister. The election board says it is in contact with the campaign about the mistakes and calls them unusual. So each of those employees of the campaign who are listed as receiving expenditures for payroll should have had their own addresses on there instead of the one uh, looked like a placeholder type address that was throughout the report. Enya says her campaign did record that address as a placeholder so that it could get its paperwork in under the deadline. Our priority was making sure that we got the reports in on time, and then we can, of course, update the information with the addresses in the amendment. There are also tens of thousands of dollars paid to companies like Jones Consulting, Rev Ang LLC, and Siagi Road LLC, all listed at the same address, 2008 South Wabash. That address is the home of Grant's Financial Services, run by the Enya campaign's treasurer, Deanna Grant. Grant could not be reached for comment, but an assistant at the firm said no companies named Jones, Rev Ang, or Siagi Road operated there. Enya says her campaign will correct those errors as well. They've been working directly with the state already on this, and again, in the same way that we're updating the information for the other addresses, that information would also be updated. The State Board of Elections says the Enya campaign does not face any fines for these mistakes just yet. If the committee has tried to live up to the spirit of transparency, they're not trying to hide something, we tend to let them correct it um, before we start administering fines on them. A few former staffers on this campaign that we spoke with say that they were never paid by the Enya campaign. That includes Enya's former communications director, who is now suing that campaign for $24,000. Enya says she was a volunteer. She says she signed a contract to be a worker. Other people who were volunteers wonder why all these other staffers got paid when they were told that this was a volunteer-based campaign. Paris, is this something that you've ever found on other campaigns for mayor? Well, this notion of sending a check to to one address when it's, you're supposed to be sending it to, to all the people who work to their address. No, this is something that's unusual according to election authorities. And we, we went through D2 forms of, of, of a lot of the candidates for mayor and D2 forms. Basically, this is the paperwork that the candidate has to submit to the Board of Elections that shows every dollar that came into the campaign and every dollar that went out. This was not something we saw at Lori Lightfoot or Tony Preckwinkle or even Gary McCarthy or anything like that. Fastidiously, they listed every check to a payroll worker at that payroll worker's address. This is something that's completely different. We don't know what's really going on. As she said in that piece, she is going to file an amendment to put the correct addresses on there. If she does that, the board says no harm, no foul. Paris, an exclusive report. Thank you. And up next, why one local sociologist believes more black women should consider dating outside their own race. What do tennis star Serena Williams, Senator Kamala Harris, and businesswoman Melody Hobson all have in common? They're all married to white men, but black women are the least likely group of women to marry, especially outside of their own race. A professor at Northwestern University explores these relationships in a new book called Interracial Relationships Between Black Women and White Men. And joining us now is the author, Cheryl Judice, who's also a sociologist and adjunct faculty member in Northwestern University's School of Education and Public Policy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having of me. Of course. So why did you want to write this book? I want to write this book, uh, Brandis, because I know of so many women, black women, who never had a romantic personal relationship. And I've always felt very bad about that and sorry about that. And the reason for that, primarily it's because they limited their search to African American men. They never thought that any other men would be attracted to or by them. So they remained single. You call this also a numbers issue. Why do you Only say that? It's a numbers issue. There are far more black men than there are black women. And this starts at age 16. The same thing doesn't happen for whites to age 32. So for a black woman to limit her dating options to African-American men by themselves, she has a very good likelihood of remaining single. 
what's happening to cause that gap at such a at such a young age at 16 for black women well right it begins with some of the things that happen to young black men they have higher mortality rates than other groups of men uh, incarceration rates um, things along that line that make it likely that there are far fewer of them uh, you document some of the reasons why black women uh, don't date outside of the race what are some of those sociological reasons but based on the social historical uh, problems that this country has had, the t uh, the historical relationships between some black men, uh, black women, and, bl and white men, that's primarily what it is. It's long entrenched, something that's going to be very difficult to change. You also talk about um, self-esteem, um, and you write a little bit about black women being so-called less desirable. What is right. that? Well, what it means is that really in this country. Western society values white women. They are at the top of the pinnacle in terms of beauty. So a black woman is not going to meet the same standards of beauty uh, for a white as a white woman because for the most part black women aren't blonde and blue-eyed or even very thin. And that tends to be the standard that is most revered. So why focus then specifically on uh, the relationships between black women and white men as opposed to black women and any other race? Because uh, traditionally, black women with white men is the least common relationship. So I was curious, so how is it that men that are at the top of the social hierarchy are getting involved with women that would be at the bottom of the social hierarchy? So that's what, that was one of the first reasons for looking at that. There are far more black men married to white women than the reverse pattern. The other thing is that I didn't want to investigate black women married to other men of color because you don't have the same so, uh, social psychological or, or historical dy uh, dynamics to deal with. So those, those relationships don't have the same uh, aspects going on uh, between them that other uh, white men and black women do. How is the experience different for younger black women versus older black women, 50s it's, and above? It's far easier for younger black women to date and marry outside of the race than it is for older women. They don't catch as much racism. They may uh, deal with other kinds of microaggressions, but they don't, ha they don't have to deal with some of the problems that their older uh, peers did. It seems we're also seeing more of these sort of interracial relationships in the media. For example, I mentioned, Absolutely. you know, at the top of this story, a number of celebrities as well. Is this good for all age groups? Yes. Uh, what winds up happening is that you're seeing more interracial relationships in terms of, of advertising as well as in terms of some shows out there. Uh, we're beginning to put out more positive portrayals of African-American women so that it does increase their visibility and hopefully, you know, uh, raises their profile in terms of desirability. Um, so let's talk about some of the stories in your book. You interviewed okay. a number of women, obviously. Uh, there's a chapter on dating. We meet a woman named Celeste who's in her late 20s. Yes. Um, tell me about her. Who'd she meet? Well, Celeste was a very interesting young woman. Uh, Celeste met a man at work. And, this, and she was interesting from the point of view that she was not a person that had trouble finding black men. But what she came to understand was that she f had trouble finding black men that were willing to commit to an exclusive relationship. So she, uh, she had been fairly popular, and because she did have some choice, she had some of her black girlfriends say to her, you know, you better w you know, watch it because you're running out of men. And they, you know, she kind of was a little choosier than they thought she needed to be. But she said she just couldn't see herself settling for someone just to say she you know, was married. So as it turned out, uh, she met her uh, now, I think they were going to get married, husband at work. And she wasn't initially attracted to him at all. It was just after they had worked together on a project, she said this ordinary white man she became really interested in, and apparently it was mutual, and they started to date. And she discovered that they had a lot in common. And eventually she, was tell she had to tell the black guy that she was dating about, she thought, I'm going to have to tell him about this. And, he, and her black boyfriend said, well, you know, I'm not ready to commit. And she knew that, and she knew the reasons for it. But she started thinking, this isn't helping me. So she continued to date her white boyfriend. And that when he was ready to commit, she felt for the first time that, OK, now I know what I, I was missing. I was missing someone that really wanted me and me by myself. And I can stop looking, and I can just enjoy this relationship. So that's where I left her. Yeah. So you talk also about um, socioeconomic as well as educational status, because mm -hmm. um, black women are often more educated than black men yes. by yeah. numbers. Um, and you talk about a couple, Denise and Todd. What do we yeah. learn from them? Well, Denise and Todd were a very interesting couple. 
first of all, not only do you have the racial issue between them, you have a, a gap socioeconomically. Todd was from a very, very well-to-do family from Chicago's North Shore. And Denise was not, but she was not from some uh, such a lower income background, but given his background, she would have been much lower on the social scale. And he was actually her second white, he's her second white husband. Her first white husband was a guy that she met in co a college whose family could care whether or not she liked them or not, and she just said they were just redneck country people. And they, but she stayed with her first husband long enough to have a child. So then she meets Todd, and Todd was this guy that was you know, a pretty, uh, I would say, liberal and also pretty urban. And he always had kind of a preference for darker skinned women. And in fact, it was her black woman friend that introduced the two of them. And her friend said, you know, I kept telling you, you, should, well, you really need to meet Todd because I think that the two of you will get along. Well, of course they did. And they did get along. And then she discovered after the relationship had been going on for a little while that about his own socioeconomic background. So it's because one day, he came and he said to her, you know, he said, let me tell you a little bit about my family. And she's thinking, uh-oh, now I'm gonna hear about how, you know, the family <laughs> really feels. And he took, the, uh, he took the conversation in a direction she didn't expect. Uh, she, he said to her, no, he said, you know, we probably have a little more than most other people. And so she then goes on to talk about not only how they got, you know, how the relationship unfolded, but about how his family had a very difficult time dealing with her at first. And now she essentially, she had to teach them how to treat her. But they, through life adventures and things that happen, now they are all very close because his family demonstrated to her when her son got in trouble, how they were right there for her and didn't treat her son as if he were not you know, a part of the family. And then of course, Todd and she have their own two children together and they've been married now more than 20 years. More than 20 years. Yep. Um, and I have to, I should probably tell viewers as well, I am a black woman who is married to a white man. Yeah. Before I let you go, quickly, what do you want readers to take away from your book? Well, the main thing I want readers to take away from my book, I have the, a message primarily to black women. Please do not limit your search for, uh, for an eligible, black uh, man to an eligible black man because the numbers are just not there to support it. Be open to dating outside of the race. Bl uh, black, white, uh, all those uh, races in between as well. But don't limit your search uh, to all of the best childbearing years you have are gone and then you wind up and you may possibly or you may possibly wind up by yourself. Okay, Cheryl Judies, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Again, the book is called Interracial Relationships Between Black Women and White Men, and you can read an excerpt on our website. And we're back with more right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. When a viewer calls and says, I know a 102-year-old woman who spent her career playing piano in Chicago, and she still plays. That gets our attention. Here's Jay Shevsky with her story. The first job I applied for, <clears throat> they liked the piano playing, but they said I was too young. I had to be 18. So what did you do? Well, I lied about my age. <laughs> <laughs> it was 1934 when 17-year-old Dorothy Olson Paletti arrived in Chicago and were visiting her 85 years later. I am 102 years old. <laughs> For nearly eight decades, Dorothy has been a busy working pianist in Chicago, playing in hotels, nightclubs, restaurants, and on radio. Dorothy Olson Poletti grew up in Bloomington, Illinois. Let me see this one. Dorothy's <laughs> first job was at age nine. This is back in Bloomington now. A local furniture store started selling pianos. So I was in the window playing the piano, so I helped them sell pianos. <laughs> well, and this is you here. She was a prodigy at the age of nine. Oh, prodigy. That's what it says right there. <laughs> 
When 17-year-old Dorothy arrived in Chicago, she stayed with relatives and found work right away. I started auditioning at hotel lounges, and that worked out very well. Mm -hmm. So, and I found out that agents were interested in me. <laughs> I don't know why. Because you had talent. Well, no, because they would get 10% of my <laughs> salary. That's why. <laughs> Dorothy was always a solo act, and she became a regular at places like the Hotel North Park, the Drake, LaSalle, Pick Congress, and her favorite, the Empire Room at the Palmer House. Every job I've had has been nothing but fun because the idea of an entertainer is to entertain mm -hmm. and to get people involved. I had them singing, I had them playing duets with me, and almost everybody would have a favorite song. Some of the songs go way back. <laughs> and, but I, so do I. <laughs> then you and I came wandering by. Dorothy married, had two kids, and she kept right on playing. I've been listening to my mother ever since I was in the womb. She was a working mom. She was, and she'd get dressed in, in the formals, and she'd make our dinner, and she'd go off to work, and we'd have a babysitter. And no matter what time she got home from working, she would get up and make breakfast for us and get us off to school. And those formals, Dorothy made them and all her clothes herself. Dorothy says it was very common for customers to want to buy the piano player a drink. When people wanted to buy me a drink, I would say, well now, this is my job. Do you drink on your job? And they, none of them ever did, or they said they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy played pop, classical, jazz, and humorous songs, like The Drinking Man's Diet. For breakfast, there's cornflakes and vodka, but cornflakes have carbohydrates, so I don't eat those fattening cornflakes. I eat the vodka straight. <laughs> Drink. Dorothy Olson Paletti's last paying gigs were in her mid 90s, though clearly she's still got the chops. If pounds you would burn off, then turn on your Smirnoff and drink. Drink. <laughs> For Chicago Tonight, this yeah. is Jay Shefsky. It goes on and on. Yeah. <laughs> Dorothy says her funny songs came in handy during World War II when she volunteered with the Red Cross to cheer up wounded soldiers. Dorothy does have one performance coming up on May 29th at Senior Palooza at the YMCA in Northbrook. There's more information about that on our website. And by the way, if you remember seeing Dorothy Olson Poletti perform over the years, drop us a note. Up next, Phil Ponce and Jeffrey Bear in an encore presentation of Ask Jeffrey. Her uncle's tales of childhood hijinks, swiping eggs from a Bronzeville area factory inspired a viewer to ask where such a factory could have been. Local history egg spurt Jeffrey Bear is here with a surprising answer to that and other viewer questions in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, good to see you. I don't know if I'm going to live that introduction down, but okay. We'll try. Okay. <laughs> Our first question comes from the West Loop. Do you know of any egg factory in Chicago's Bronzeville area during the 1940s or 50s? My dearly departed Uncle Lamont told us stories how he would, as a young boy, misbehave and steal eggs from a nearby egg factory. Well, we think Uncle Lamont was maybe swiping eggs from the Murphy Butter and Egg Company, which was at 20th and Calumet, so it's a little bit north of Bronzeville. Um, and actually, as you'll see here, the building is still standing. And that does not look like an egg factory, no. or at least what I envision an egg factory to look like. Uh, it doesn't. It was in, uh, it, it's actually more, more like a mansion than a, than a butter and egg warehouse. Um, originally, it was built as a private home for a wealthy Chicago family, and it's been beautifully restored, as you can see. So how it became a storage 
for a facility for poultry and dairy products is really the story of the rise and fall and rebirth actually of this neighborhood. Um, a, a banker uh, and one-time Chicago Board of Trade president named Calvin Wheeler built the home at, at uh, 2020 South Calumet in 1870. At the time, the neighborhood, which we now know as the Prairie Avenue Historic District, uh, was fast becoming fashionable for Chicago's early mercantile and industrial barons like George Pullman, Marshall Field, later the Glessners. Um, the neighborhood is, was often referred to as Chicago's first gold coast and back then sometimes called the sunny street that held the sifted few. The sifted few. Indeed. <laughs> The, the neighborhood is often uh, it, it filled with, you know, back then with, with all these captains of industry. Um, it remained a private home, this house, uh, for more than 30 years. Um, but as industry and vice districts sort of, sort of encroaching on the neighborhood, the moneyed residents sort of fled en masse to what is today the Gold Coast on the north side. The mansions fell into ruin like this one, which is this was the Otis House over on Prairie Avenue. Or as in the case of the Wheeler House, which we're talking about, it was converted to other uses. Um, the house was sold to a publishing company later in 1944 to the Murphy Butter and Egg Company. Murphy Butter already had its offices in the neighboring house. So if you can see in this photograph, um, uh, you can just make out a sign on the wall there that says, Good Milk. The Wheeler House is just to the left of that house, which was serving as the office. So after um, Murphy uh, Butter left the property in the 1980s, the house pretty much sat there um, vacant for years, it was repeatedly threatened with demolition. Now, I worked as a volunteer tour guide, uh, a docent, at the Glessner House, right? One block over on Prairie Avenue um, in the 1980s. And I can tell you, Phil, back then the neighborhood was pretty desolate, a lot of vacant uh, buildings, vacant lots, things like that. But the Wheeler House was saved. How, how did that happen? Yes, um, thankfully in 1997, um, the home was purchased, get this, for $10,000. And uh, after two years of restoration, it was uh, granted Chicago landmark status. It's also on the National Register. Um, the buyer, Phil, had a lot of foresight because, indeed, the South Loop has grown into one of Chicago's hottest neighborhoods now. And today, the Wheeler Mansion is a boutique bed and breakfast. And I bet I know what they serve for breakfast. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the next question. What happened to the fool killer submarine pulled from the Chicago River in 1915? A fool killer, yes. So the, the short answer is no one knows. And Phil, not only is this a mystery, it's one of the most bizarre Chicago stories I have ever encountered. I had never heard of this. Yeah, yeah, the fool killer. Well, okay, so here's what, here we go. It starts with a diver named William, here he is, William Frenchy Deneau. Uh, he became kind of a local celebrity following the, the horrible tragedy of the Eastland disaster in, in July 1915. You remember that was when a huge steamship tipped over on its side in the Chicago River. More than 800 people were killed. Deneau claimed to have recovered 250 bodies from the river. Really? Was that true? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Deneau is usually described as a showman who doesn't let the facts get in the way of a good story. I actually describe myself that way sometimes. <laughs> um, a, few <laughs> a few months later, Deneau was laying cable um, in a different area of the river when he struck something solid in the muck and it turned out it was a homemade submarine about 40 feet long. Uh, where it was exactly in the river has been variously reported as Rush Street, Wells Street, Madison Street. Um, Deneau went ahead and got special permission from the federal government to raise it himself in January 1916. And when it was up, Deneau claimed to have discovered human bones and a dog's skull inside. Now, of course, today, a gruesome discovery like that would automatically lead to an investigation by authorities, but Frenchy Deneau, the self-promoter, saw it as a business opportunity, and he displayed his submarine on State Street and charged people a dime for looky-loos to gawp at the submarine and its uh, skeletons. Newspapers immediately floated the theory that the remains inside belonged to a Chicago accountant slash inventor named Peter Nissen, who experimented with vessels like this. In fact, people started calling it fool killer because uh, that's what Nissen called his inventions, but when someone bothered to fact check this, they found Nissen had died in another craft in 1904. Others speculated that the skeleton might have been a Michigan City shoemaker named Laudner Phillips, who built primitive subs in the 1840s. It actually looked a lot like the Fool Killer, but like the sub, that theory didn't hold water. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Phillips had, had died in New York, so to this day nobody knows um, 
where the skeletons came from. Historians have often wondered that, uh, whether um, Deneau planted the skeletons himself in there to boost ticket sales. And what happened to the submarine? Well, it appears that Deneau sold it to a carnival, which was called Parker's Greatest Shows, took it to Iowa in the summer of 1916. Um, but a few years ago, a UIC grad student found an ad from September 16, so after the, the summer, um, that seems to indicate that the submarine came back to Chicago and was displayed at Riverview Park. At the bottom of this ad, you can see in tiny writing, it says, see the big submarine fool killer. Mm. So for now, that's the last we know of it. And by the way, uh, we should thank historian Adam Selzer, uh, who helped us get our story straight on the fool killer. Thank you, Jeffrey, as always. You're welcome. And you can find more on this and other Ask Jeffrey stories on our website. Ask Jeffrey is made possible in part by BMO Harris Bank. <laughs> what? Oh no, I have suspicious activity on my debit card. Now what? You know, ah! oh, sorry. With BMO Harris, you can just freeze your card right from your phone. Wow, really? Yeah. Ah! You can unfreeze it, too. Uh, who's... How many roommates do you have? That feeling you get when a bank puts security at your fingertips. That's the BMO effect. The term outsider artist is big enough to include a creative person without classical training and a silent artist who communicates only through the mysterious pictures she makes. We recently visited a dual art show in town that looks at works by artists from Chicago all the way to Auckland, New Zealand. All of them make the case for art as therapy. Here's another look. At Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, a pair of new shows couldn't be more different. On one side, cartoon worlds created by a New Zealand artist who hasn't spoken in more than 50 years. On the other side, works by two Chicago artists who fight addiction with creativity. For this, Intuit brought in a curator who ran the Southside Community Arts Center for six years. We're in a space of outside art. At the Southside Community Arts Center, they're not called outsider artists, they're called artists. Labels are really important to this institution and we need to challenge labels, but also kind of bolster them and figure out when to leverage them. So it's exciting for these artists to be able to tap into something, a whole community of artists that traditionally would, would not be in dialogue with. He chose artists with colorful work and colorful lives. I left Chicago in 2007 in order to join the Army. Uh, I was 38 years old. I was going through a really rough patch. Uh, it was my own form of treatment um, in order to overcome my own personal addictions and also to support my daughters. Early on, Robert Johnson painted the glass on discarded windows, but he stopped making art for years while in the Army. Now, he has a new approach. I've kind of shifted to different materials, canvas board, kind of found canvases from thrift stores and things like that, uh, that I just rework. But I do still have a basement full of windows that I will be giving some attention to. <laughs> we asked the other Chicago artist in this show about using art as therapy. I'm using it now to kind of um, keep me anchored because I'm really struggling to stay clean and stay healthy. Um, it's very important for me and my son. Nix's work includes sculpture, metalwork, and collage. This one is called Heroin the Musical. I'll start maybe with an idea that may totally change by the time I'm finished with the piece. And what happens is I start creating stories in my mind as I'm working on the piece, kind of narratives that only make sense to me. And they become, the piece kind of evolves out of that and becomes part of this narrative in my head that, you know, would seem like nonsense to someone else. In the gallery next door, cartoon narratives have an unusual origin. They were created by Susan Takerongi King, a now 68-year-old New Zealander who hasn't spoken in almost 60 years. Susan was one of 12 children, and she began uh, creating art at a very young age, received much support from her family. She quit speaking by the age of eight, and so we'll never quite know exactly the, the meaning behind uh, each individual artwork. Coupled with these, uh, these wonderful drawings, we have the archives of her sister, Petita Cole, who has begun collecting works that relate to Susan's uh, life and artwork. We spoke to her sister about growing up with a unique sibling, at first in rural New Zealand. 
there wasn't really a school for Susan in the small town uh, because she um, had special needs. Um, there was no diagnosis, but she was a little different. She couldn't talk, though she was talking prolifically as a three-year-old. In order to address Susan's educational needs, we, uh, the family shifted to Auckland. Susan stopped drawing for almost 20 years and then resumed her work in 2008. Her life story became the basis for a feature-length documentary. She keeps to herself, um, she draws in the background, and we always know they're great drawings, but there's not really any, or very little, if any, you know, interaction. In recent years, her work has been shown in Paris, New York, and now Chicago. Now it's like everybody's rallying around Susan, you know, it's like, <laughs> she's a man, you know. The work by the two Chicago artists will be on view at Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art, through this weekend. The drawings by the New Zealand artist are on view until August. You can find out more on our website. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also watch via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. 400 pages and so many questions. Analysis of special counsel Robert Mueller's report that's set to be released tomorrow. And we harvest crops from our cold frame and prepare our organic gardening beds for spring planting. We leave you now with Dorothy, Dorothy Olson Poletti, the 102 year old pianist you met earlier with more of everybody's favorite song, The Drinking Man's Diet. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thank you for watching. Good night. <clears throat> I'm on the drinking man's diet. <laughs> I learned from a book I was loaned. It's really terrific and quite scientific, and I'm half stoned. <laughs> For breakfast, there's cornflakes and vodka, but cornflakes have carbohydrates. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, proud sponsors of the 25th Annual Clifford Symposium on Tort Law and Social Policy, held at DePaul University College of Law, April 25th and 26th. As we used to think, if pounds you would burn off, then turn on your Smirnoff and drink.